All right, just waiting for people to join us. Give about uh, five minutes to see um, how many attendees we can get, and then we'll get started. So bear with us for the next five minutes or so. For anyone just joining, we're going to give about five minutes or so to let everyone join. Um, so bear with us for a little bit. We'll get started in no time. Great questions coming through already. You will receive a webinar replay link if you could not make it today or want to share with any of your coworkers. No problem there. All righty. Looks like our participant number has come to a slight halt. So I guess that is our cue to get started. All right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you all for joining us on this fine Wednesday lunch hour for the kickoff of our webinar, Cracking the Code to Commercial HVAC Training, led by subject matter expert Dan Clapper. My name is Marty Abel, and I'm a marketing campaign specialist here at Interplay Learning. While we are waiting for more participants to join, please take a second to answer the poll in the chat to let us know that you're with us today. We'll be popping up a few throughout the webinar, uh, and we want to make sure that y'all have a chance to participate. Oh. Sorry, guys. <laughs> All right, now I'm back on track. But first, a little housekeeping before we get started. All attendees must be muted for the duration of the webinar. And if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box in your Zoom control panel, and we'll go over your questions at the end. Additionally, you will receive a webinar replay link 24 hours after the webinar has ended. Now, I'd like to introduce our expert, Dan Clapper. Dan serves as the Commercial HVAC and Facilities Maintenance Market Director for Interplay Learning. Dan brings 25 years of experience to Interplay in a variety of roles across the HVAC market. Over the years in this space, Dan has developed a passion for helping trades professionals grow their business and their people. From installing boilers and HVAC equipment with his father as a teenager, to sales, design, and distribution at the wholesale level, to training thousands of HVAC professionals across the country at the manufacturing level, Dan has a unique perspective on best practices. After sending out 5,000 plus free copies of his first book, Get More HVAC Leads, Five Must-Have Strategies for 2018, Dan realized that the biggest challenge in our industry is a skilled labor shortage, not lead generation. With tens of millions of people in the U.S. who make less than 
an hour, HVAC and facilities teams can build a pipeline of talent if they just had better in-house training infrastructure. Here at Interplay, Dan now helps business owners and leaders leverage 3D simulation-based training to help attract new talent to the industry and upskill them faster and more efficiently than ever before. Thanks for being here today, Dan. Hey, thanks, Marty. I appreciate the introduction. I'm definitely excited to dive in. Absolutely. Great. We're glad to have you here. We're ready to learn from the best on what it takes to establish a successful commercial HVAC training program. For everyone in the audience, you can see our key takeaways that we're going to explore throughout the duration of the webinar. Upon the conclusion of this session, you can expect to apply these as action items to your own training program, or even as a recommendation to your boss regarding the current training strategy. So what does cracking the code to commercial HVAC training mean anyways? Well, that's why Dan is here to help us answer just that. He will reveal his insights into what it takes to establish a successful in-house HVAC training program. With that being said, let's kick off our conversation with the first key takeaway. So Dan, in your experience, what are some of the benefits of having easy access to troubleshooting tools on the job? And can you provide us with some examples of these tools that you've utilized when training an HVAC technician? Sure. So I think a good way to start the conversation is to talk about what uh, training looks like in the in the HVAC space now, right? I think ultimately it's a mix of on the job training, classroom training, manufacturer training, uh, distributor training, but it, it's all kind of like shotgunned out there. It's all spread apart. There's no real organization to it. Um, for the last 10 or 15 years before I came to Interplay, I worked for a lot of the major manufacturers and I, I was one of the people that would go around to, you know, contractors all over the country and deliver classroom training. And, and really, one of the big things I saw with classroom training is I would go in front of a group of uh, 20 to 30 technicians or so, and it was really tough to gauge the skill level of, of each of the technicians in the, in the group. You know, sometimes my content would be way over the head of the green techs. Sometimes my content would be too, too easy you know, too basic for that senior level tech. So um, there, there's some challenges that come with in-person training. A another in-person training thing that I kept running into as well is it, it's kind of based on the schedule of the training and it didn't really immediately apply to what the technicians were working on that day or that week. So, you know, we rarely provide in the field resources and sometimes it'd be a year or two before we did follow-up training. So most of the time this classroom training or, or what we're used to in the industry, the technicians, if they don't start applying it right away, they, they, they pretty much start forgetting it, right? So and another dynamic when we talk about uh, commercial training or HVAC training is uh, it, on the job training and, and what, what an interesting dynamic in our space is, is all of our senior techs or the, the people that are doing that on the job training, they might be really great technicians, but they're most of the time they're not the best teachers. So a ton of time gets wasted by your, by senior technicians, you know, sometimes going through the basics of, of refrigeration cycles or talking about things that um, probably should have been uh, addressed beforehand before they even showed up to the site. So really, as, as I transition here to talk about on the job troubleshooting, the, the first thing is, the first strategy I would have is before they even get to the job site is to set a baseline learning foundation um, through online training. You know, this can include topics like the refrigeration cycle, how to read a wiring diagram, how to use a multimeter, how to use a set of gauges and so on. Uh, the, the more tech, the more, foundational knowledge that that technician has before they go out to the uh, job site, the, the better confidence they'll have when they're on, on the job site. And, and, and ultimately, this will save you a lot of time and money. 
Um, now the senior techs can focus on, on just the, the meat and potatoes, right? When they're in front of the unit doing that on the job training, instead of going through safety procedures or going, going through the foundational stuff, right? Um, also, it, it saves time from, from, a, from a payroll and traveling cost of sending, if you were gonna send your text to uh, in-person training classes and instead our classroom classes, right? So what's really cool about keeping that foundational knowledge through online training is they can be accessed anywhere, anytime. Technicians can have that resources handy when they're on the job and, and running into trouble. So that will reduce the calls to their managers for help and reduce callbacks. I talk to, I talk to owners and service managers all the time and they, they, they say they spend probably between five and 10 hours a week answering the calls from their technicians, right? So if, if you have this baseline foundation of knowledge online, that'll reduce that time. Wow, who knew tr a training could be so troubling to your watch and resources? And you know, I really like how you laid out the true effects on your business when your technicians aren't equipped with the proper tools. Speaking of trouble, this segues well into our next topic of conversation, which is safety and compliance as a priority. So Dan, could you give us your opinion as to why safety protocols and compliance should take priority as a commercial HVAC business owner? And could you also give us some examples of the potential harm that could arise with failure to comply? Yeah, I think I, when I think about that question, um, it kind of reminds me of a story. A, a couple of weeks ago, I was talking to the head of risk management for a major commercial contractor, and I was really surprised at one of the statistics they had. Um, they have an equal number of safety accidents or safety violations from, from green techs or, or techs just starting out as they do with their senior techs that have been in the field 20, 25 years. Um, and, and basically what he was saying is these technicians start to cut corners when it comes to safety as they progress through their career. You know, maybe they don't want to take that extra step to do the lockout tag out, or maybe they don't want to make sure the ladder is secure or, or, or things like that. And, and this actually creates a, a greater risk. And, and I think it's when I, when I think about training, uh, it's, uh, or when I talk to commercial contractors, safety is always a top priority, but I don't see it built into, into their training. So, so really strategy number two for me would be build safety into the workflow of every maintenance and service call, like literally part of the checklist and make sure safety is a part of every training course you go through as well, right? So if you're doing a, if your techs are going through a class on rooftops, you know, make sure there's a, a section at the beginning of the class of walking around the rooftop and looking for potential safety hazards and going through the lockout tag out procedures and things like that. We really need to prevent this like Dennis the Menace type of technician and make sure they go through this step-by-step -step procedure. Um, what, what's, what, where, I, where I think, you know, safety cannot, we can't train to prevent every single incident, but we definitely can re reduce, you know, minimize the risk of energy through proper training. And, and another key point here is um, when, when you think about safety, and, and I'm sure a lot of you know this, but whenever you lose someone uh, off the job, if they get hurt or something, that eats up a ton of time, time and uh, energy and cost to your business, right? And instead of all those calls that he could have been going on, you're losing the money there. So it's just really important to build this in. When, when I start thinking about what topics this means as far as safety, uh, I, I said before, lockout, tagout procedures. I know a lot of facility or, or um, contractors, th those tags are just sitting in a box somewhere. Um, we can talk about electrical safety, HVAC safety, uh, preventing slips, trips, and falls, fire and safety prevention, ladder safety, back safety and injury, hand and power tool safety, scissor lift safety, refrigerant safety. I, I, I'm part of a lot of Facebook groups with these technicians. I see photos all the time of, of guys burning themselves with refrigerant. So um, it, it's just imperative for me 
are imperative for our company if they they really want to grow their training that they build safety right into it. You know, I love the topic of safety, Dan. When discussing safety in reference to the trades, my mind automatically shifts to electrical work, but I know that's only a scratch on the surface. Safety training and compliance are important to all the trades, as we know. So for our next question, Dan, when you're training green techs, how do you ensure that they are competent and ready for the field? And could you give us some consequences if they are not properly prepared? Yeah, and, and again, I get to talk to a ton of, I've gotten to have conversations with a ton of contractors across the country. And at almost every single one of them have told me stories when they, they hire someone new based off their resume and they send them out to the field and, and they get burned, right? Maybe they set they talk themselves up a lot more than than what they, you know, actually have skills for. So the third strategy when it comes to training, which I, I think is just so imperative, and I barely see any contractors have have a good strategy around this, is to get a true evaluation and assessment of the skill level of your technicians. So this can come in this can come in the form of online, like an online skills assessment or maybe an in-person assessment, um, testing their knowledge on electrical diagrams, airflow, refrigeration cycles, tool competency, like much like get much more into the weeds of what is the skill level of your technicians. Um, what 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 this really allows you to do, and sometimes it's okay, like when I say you give the assessments and you find where there's gaps, that's okay. That just shows you where they need to learn and to have, have that learning uh, path ready and able so they you can just, when, once they come on board, you can give them that training immediately to fill those gaps, right? And um, this isn't just for green techs too. If you, if you think about that assessment as well, think about your, your current set of employees and, and do you really know their skill level across all the different types of equipment and, and such? So I, I always recommend doing an assessment for, for you know, mid-career or even senior techs as well, right? And, and so strategy number four is to build promotional paths that will help your technicians gain knowledge on, on the type of equipment you'd like them to be working on in the future. So um, this, this why, why that's so important is you can send the right tech to the right job the first time and also reduce callbacks. And what's really cool about understanding these skill gaps too, and you can create individual learning pathways, which are so much more po powerful than the classroom training I was talking about at the beginning of the webinar here. Um, individual learning pathways will accelerate their career progress and it actually helps retain that employee. Like you'll increase your retention rates because they feel like they're advancing in their career um, on an individual level. Absolutely, Dan. Real in those returns. I can only imagine what trades business owners could do with those extra profits by prioritizing and doubling down on training. Speaking of profits, this brings us to our next topic regarding the rewards and regulations of technician training. As a leader within any organization, it could be hard to motivate and incentivize technicians to actually do the training on their own time. Could you go through some helpful tactics you have utilized to motivate technicians to upskill, cross-train, and further their education? Sure. I love the topic of incentivizing training. Um, but the first point I really like to make is that most companies out there are taking like a very passive or reactive approach to training. You know, they they see a training calendar and say, hey, maybe I'll send send my my technicians to that. Or, you know, they're, they're, there's not a real strategy around it. And and when you think about a, 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 your, your company or, um, your goals as a company. If you want to grow 20, 30, 50% over the next year or two, that means you need to grow your people at that rate too, right? You need to grow the skill level of your people and you need to keep bringing in new people. So um, one of my pet peeves, if you will, or it just drives me crazy when a company won't pay their technicians for to go through the training. 
I, I see a lot of companies that expect the, you know, people to go home on their own time, seven, eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night and go through training class that, that you're, that's, it's going to take so much longer to get to your, your goals. Right. So um, the strategy number five for me would be to incorporate paid time on the weekly schedule designated for training and upskilling, you know, whether it's two times a week, Tuesday, Thursday mornings, I've seen a couple different strategies there. Um, Wednesday mornings for a couple hours. I think it's important to do it in the morning before they go out to work instead of in the afternoon. Um, so, so definitely incorporate paid time on the weekly schedule. Uh, another strategy is uh, tie additional monetary incentives to their training progress. You know, if you put together a pathway that, hey, if you go through this group of courses, I'll also, you know, give you a little extra gift card, maybe a, maybe a dollar incentive. Um, I've seen, I've seen people reward with tools, like maybe you can get a, a new set of gauges or, or some cool power tools based if you go through certain training objectives. And it, it just creates this environment of you as the company showing that training is a top priority. I, I actually see companies, uh, put training as a big part of their quarterly or annual reviews too. So if, if your technicians are looking for a raise, tie that to training, tie that to the, how have you grown yourself in the last you know couple months or year? And I, I think the last strategy, which you know probably gets overlooked too, there is a lot of value to the non-monetary incentives too. This is, you know, printing out the certificates, um, hanging them on the wall around the office, top learner of the month, you know, creating some sort of, uh, you know, competition among your among your staff. There's always there's always fun with uh, rewards around non monetary trainings as well. Awesome. With, with with rewards like that, I would be the first one to complete my assigned training. Heck. <laughs> but even with the non-monetary ideas that you provided us with, this proves that rewards for your technicians don't have to cost a fortune and can still provide a similar value to your workforce in the end. Thanks for that awesome insight, Dan, and thank you all for joining this webinar session. Now we will go ahead and take some time to answer questions from the audience. Just as a reminder, please be sure to type your questions into the question box in your control panel. So for our first question, it looks like for someone just getting started, how would you recommend a mom and pop shop owner like myself to get started on a trading program? Take it away, Dan. Yeah, that's a good one. I, I would say, at the very first, find some sort of way to create a, a baseline knowledge or baseline program. Uh, what there's a there's uh, obviously I would like to plug Interplay Learning as, as one of those options, but there's a lot of options out there. How, what type of training can you put in place to create a standard level of knowledge across your company? I, I would start with that, and I would also definitely try to incorporate assessments. Awesome. I like that answer a lot. Um, next question. If there is one thing that I should take away from this webinar, what should that be? I, I think I, I'd probably say it's the, the comment about growth of a company. So it, it, when you take a look at whatever your goal is for 2020, 23 of uh, how, how fast you want to grow your company or what percentage you want to grow your company, if it's 5%, 10%, 15%, whatever it is, think of that in the terms of training. What, what percentage of training do I need to provide to my people? How, how can I improve their skill set 10, 15, 20%? And, and that really starts, that really starts turning the wheels of the importance of really formalizing a, a, a good training strategy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Dan, we have some questions from the chat. Uh, Michael Mendez, he's asking, uh, what is a good resource for technicians to use to refine HVAC knowledge? I know you mentioned some courses earlier. Maybe you could hit on those. Sure. 
Um, it, w- what's really, it, it's funny when I have a lot of conversations with, with these, with these business owners, sometimes they, they even say that the senior techs, it's good for them to go through that foundational knowledge. I, I like calling it foundational knowledge or core knowledge. And, uh, it's, it's going through the refrigeration cycle. It's going through, can they, can you truly read an electrical wiring diagram and go through all the steps to, to, to test that out? Um, of, of course, safety, I, I talked about, I, you know, the lockout tag out and some of the things just, just to build that in, into the procedures. I, um, let's see. That's the, that, those are the core ones that I, I hear the most. Awesome. Uh, we're going to move on to our next question from the audience from Tim. Uh, Tim says, we acquired an HVAC company and training has been non-existent. Having challenges with the culture, how would you recommend new owners create motivation? Uh, dude, that's a that's a great question, right? Um <laughs> So, so the term, I don't, I would always go to the term of uh, promotion pathways, right? So, so sometimes training has, oh, what's the right way to say it? A lot of people in our field have, have big egos. Like, I don't need to be trained. I know all of that. But when you tie it to promotion or an incentive pay increases, I, I think that's really, really how you have to look at that is, look, I we I want you to go through this training and at you'll get that that 50 cent raise or a dollar raise or three dollar raise, whatever it is, right? So so building a culture around your performance reviews are tied to an incentive pay. Awesome. Great answers. Um, our next question that we have is we have a contract with a manufacturer and tend to send out a lot of our technicians out to their training facilities for ongoing education. Do you have any pointers for weaving in more supplemental and ongoing training on top of what we are already doing? Yes. Um, so I, I think I think this is a great question. Um, how I would answer that is, I, it's almost like the career pro- progression question, right? So first, I'd make sure that you get the core knowledge that that your technicians need, and then as as they start working on different types of equipment, you you can train them on different types of equipment, and then as you continue down that path of career progression, um, all of you know this: each manufacturer has their own proprietary controls, things like that. And, and pretty much you need to go through the individual manufacturer's training to get that knowledge. So that's where I, I see that as like a step one, step two, step three. And if you build out these learning pathways or the, these promotional pathways, it's a great way to weave in that manufacturer training as well. But I, 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 I wanna make sure the point of to build that into that progression and not just randomly send people to manufacture training when it doesn't really make sense where they are in their career. Absolutely. Great, great answers coming. Um, that moves on to our next question, which is what is one of the hardest challenges you've had to overcome when it comes to training? Hmm. Hey, let me think about that for a second. I, I would say the biggest challenge is to truly identify the skill set of of your employees, right? Uh, they might they might put on their resume they know a lot of things and, and they might talk a good game, but I hear it so many times. Like you get out to the job site and they actually don't know what they're doing. So so what's a way through um, through maybe some simulation training or even like a, a dummy unit in your office. How, how can you truly assess the skill skill set of your of your workforce? So it, it, it's it's a hard it's a hard thing to go through. But once you create that standard of assessing that skill set, now you that we get back to this baseline. You can you can grow from that baseline once you understand their their skills. 
Yeah, absolutely. All right, this brings us to our last question. Everyone from the audience, if you still have questions, please put them in the chat now. Um, last question. I have a lot of techs out in the field that are still making mistakes. How would you handle that with training? Uh, yeah, that's great. Um, you know, it's it's a it's a I, I've hear, heard it called two things. Uh, one of the ways I've heard it called is remediation training. When, when I talk to the, the risk, you know, risk management people, they they want they call it remediation training because it's really important for for someone to go through that process again so they can do it right the next time. But I think it also comes back to just the if you have these pathways built out for promotion or these career laddering pathways, if they're making mistakes in the field, maybe they need to take a couple step backs in that back in that pathways. Maybe they need to go through some of the fundamentals again, right? So it's it's just I would say that's almost a, a level of, of what I was talking about of, of having the right assessment of, of your of your tech skill set. Right, because if you had the right assessment, maybe you maybe you wouldn't have sent them to that job in the first place. So it, it's really just creating that 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 path, that learning career path, and making sure people are in the right spot, and you're sending them to the right work orders. Absolutely, I love that answer. All righty, everyone, thank you so much for joining. We appreciate you being here. As a reminder, you'll be receiving a webinar replay link following the conclusion of this session. Thanks again for joining us today, and we hope this helps with cracking the code to commercial HVAC business and training program. Thanks, y'all.